Welcome to the Futility Closet Podcast, forgotten stories from the pages of history. Visit us online to sample more than 9,000 quirky curiosities from a cat that wired a dam to a rose drawn by an earthquake. This is episode 116. I'm Greg Ross. And I'm Sharon Ross. In today's show, we'll explore some curiosities and unanswered questions from Greg's research, including the love affair that inspired the Rolls-Royce hood ornament, a long-distance dancer, Otto von Bismarck's dogs, and a craftily plotted Spanish prison break. We'll also run after James Earl Ray and puzzle over an unsociable jockey. This is just a collection of notes and some open questions from my research. We've done this before from time to time, Uh, just miscellaneous items. These are not connected, and they're in no particular order. Here we go. The hood ornament on Rolls-Royce cars is a flying lady known as the Spirit of Ecstasy. It's a woman leaning forward with her arms extended behind her, so it looks as though she's flying. There's a story that this commemorates a secret love affair between J.W.E. Douglas Scott Montague, who was a pioneer of the automobile movement, And the model for the emblem, a woman named Eleanor Velasco Thornton, the two of these uh, had fallen in love in 1902 when she served as his secretary at the Car Illustrated magazine, where he was editor, and they kept the affair secret or known only to their circle of friends for more than 10 years. They had to, in part, because of the enormous difference between them in social class. Uh, Montague, when he decided he wanted a hood ornament, chose the English sculptor Charles Robinson Sykes, a friend of his, to design it. And Sykes, the story goes, chose Eleanor as his model. Uh, allegedly, an early version of the ornament had Eleanor holding a finger to her lips to symbolize the secrecy of their affair. This is one of those stories that's so great that it tends to get just bandied about without much concern for how accurate it is. I, certainly, uh, she, from what I am able to understand, the two of these did have a relationship, and she did pose for the emblem. But whether it was meant to represent her or symbolize the relationship is a lot murkier. Sykes, the sculptor himself, described the figure as, quote, a graceful little goddess, the spirit of ecstasy who has selected road travel as her supreme delight. And in a 1986 article for the Rolls-Royce Owners Club of Australia, Paul Tritton wrote, Although Eleanor probably posed for the specific purpose of helping Charles develop his design for the mascot, it is not in its finished form a figure of her or any real person. Uh, I, I had hoped at one point to do a whole podcast feature on this, but it's just so hard to pin down the actual facts that I've kind of backed off from it. But if anyone out there knows more about this, I'd just like to know it because it sounds like an interesting story, whatever the truth is. I'm just kind of tickled that maybe it's supposed to represent the goddess of automobile travel. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It just seems like every... Whatever information I can find about this, someone is given by usually someone who's selling something or other. It's hard to get just a clean, clear, objective accounting of what the actual facts were. Yeah, It's often said that Alexandre Dumas ate an apple every morning at dawn beneath the Arc de Triomphe. Allegedly, he did this under doctor's orders. The doctor was hoping to force him into a regular schedule of waking and sleeping. For all I know, that's true. It's bandied all over the place these days in collections of uh, the interesting habits of famous writers. Uh, But I went back to see what the earliest mention I could find is. That turns out to be a 1911 article in the Dietetic and Hygienic Gazette, attributing the intervention to Hungarian physician David Gruby. Uh, I've confirmed that Gruby served as a physician to Dumas, both the father and the son, but I can't find anything about an apple. The timing looks reasonable. Uh, The elder Dumas died in 1870, so it could be true for all I know, but it just sounds so pat that it makes me a little suspicious. I've been reading a book by N.T.P. Murphy called A Woodhouse Handbook from 2013 that details the now vanished world of the British aristocracy as described in the comic novels of P.G. Woodhouse, which has some wonderful anecdotes, uh, but some of them are a little hard to confirm. I'm hoping someone will be able to help us with that. One is that in the late 1920s at London's Savoy Hotel, customers would simply hand their things to the cloakroom attendant without receiving a ticket in return. You just give him your hat and coat. And then at the end of the evening when you came back, he would wordlessly and correctly hand them back to you. And you'd walk away flattered that you were either so distinguished or striking or good looking that he could know you at sight and give you your, your correct articles back. Uh, Murphy writes, the bubble burst when the attendant was suddenly taken ill one evening and the owners had to identify their own belongings. To their embarrassment and indignation, they found that each hat had a scrap of paper inside with a succinct description of their appearance. Hobo was the least impolite description recorded. (laughs) I hope that's true. I dearly want that to be true, but I haven't been able to confirm it. Uh, In particular, I'd like to get a list of the epithets that he'd used. It said that thereafter, the hotel adopted this ticket system where you, when you handed your hat in, he gave you a ticket in response that you could use to redeem it later on. So if anyone knows about that, please write in. 
Another anecdote from the same source, I'll just read this paragraph. In 2001, the August Travelers Club in Pall Mall decided to open its archives. They include the eminently sensible reaction of the committee when Mr. Percival Osborne committed suicide in the lower billiard room in 1905. Unfortunately, the bullet went on to damage the billiard table as well as Mr. Osborne. To minimize future damage to the club fittings, the committee posted a notice advising members that if they wish to commit suicide on the club's premises, they should do so in the downstairs lavatory. (laughs) That one I have a bit more hope is true. I found a reference to it in an article in The Telegraph in 2001, which I'll put in the show notes. Uh, If anyone has any more details about that, please let us know. Here's a good one. The Providence United Methodist Church in Swan Quarter, North Carolina, was supposedly moved by the hand of God in 1876. The story goes that in 1874, the congregation wanted to build on prime property in Swan Quarter, which is a village on Pamlico Sound in northeastern North Carolina, not far from here, actually. The owner of the land refused to sell to them, so they put up the building elsewhere, but just before the building was to be dedicated, a hurricane blew through the area during September 16th and 17th, 1876, and the water rose and engulfed the town, lifting the sanctuary off its foundations. A church brochure explains what happened next. A miracle was happening. The church was floating down the road. The church moved by the hand of God. It went straight down the road to a corner and bumped into a general store owned by George V. Creedel. The corner is now Oyster Creek Road and U.S. 264 business. Then a curious thing happened. The building took a sharp right turn and headed down the road for about two city blocks until it reached the corner of what is now Church Street. Then it moved slightly off its straight-line course, took another turn to the left, crossed the Carawan Canal directly in front of the place where people desired the church to be, and settled exactly in the center of the Sam Sadler property, the site which had been refused. In other words, the church made its way to the land that they intended it for anyway and took up residence there and remained there. The land was subsequently sold to the congregation, so they got what they wanted. The church was originally called the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the name was changed to the Providence United Methodist Church as a tribute to what the members saw as divine intervention. I set this down in my notes with the two words gigantically doubtful, but I mention it here because I've seen it mentioned in two different books written by atmospheric scientists. One of these, Hurricanes in the Middle Atlantic States by Rick Schwartz, says that in some tellings the landowner, after this miracle, sees the owner of his ways and deeds his property to the church. Uh, But Schwartz writes, recent genealogical research shows that rather the owner, his wife, and their child actually happened to die shortly afterward, and the church paid a small sum for their property in a court-approved auction in 1881. Snopes, the internet fact-checking site, lists this whole story as mostly true, believe it or not. Huh. The church has now been extended as brick and massive, but the, the smaller wooden rear part apparently actually did float to its, the current location. Which is oh, so true. it was just part of the church, not the whole church. Yeah, we should drive up there sometime and just <laughs> see what we can find out. Here's a small one and a long shot. Uh, in Constable's Clouds, which is a book about the English romantic painter John Constable, and particularly his paintings of clouds, published by the National Galleries of Scotland in 2000, Edward Morris writes, It is this moment of early morning light and what has been described as, quote, the atmosphere of stillness tinged with expectancy that Constable translates into the finished canvas. He quotes, puts quote marks around that phrase, the atmosphere of stillness tinged with expectancy, which I love but haven't able to track down. I love the early morning myself. The whole world has this sense of being a, a play before the curtain has risen. And I think that's a perfect way of putting it, but I haven't been able to find out whom he's quoting there. As I say, that's a long shot, but if anybody can find out where that phrase comes from, I'd love to know. A bit of conceptual art. In episode 68, I mentioned that the artist Stanley Brown, in 1960, mailed out invitations proclaiming the shoe stores of Amsterdam to be his artwork, or their arrangement, I guess. Here's another. In 1969, the German artist Josef Beuys accepted full responsibility for any snow that fell in Dusseldorf between the 15th and 20th of February. I don't know whether any did. Here's an old one, I'm afraid. Uh, reader Olga Isaacson wrote to me in December 2011. I'm sorry, Olga, I've sat on this for five years. She writes, Hey, Greg, I'm currently reading a book called Dreadnought by Robert K. Massey, which is about the events and people that led up to World War I. And while it is full of really good tidbits for the futility closet, my favorite so far is this one. This is about the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. While the Chancellor worked, his giant dog, Tiras, lay on the carpet, staring fixedly at his master. Tiras, known as the Reichshund, or Dog of the Empire terrorized the chancellery staff, and people speaking to Bismarck were advised to make no unusual gestures, which Tiras might interpret as threatening. Prince Alexander Gorchakov, the elderly Russian foreign minister, once raised his arm to make a point and found himself pinned to the floor, staring up at Tiras' bared teeth. Apparently, this is true. He had 
the the name Tiros was given to a whole succession of dogs, some of which were Great Danes. I mean, they were just enormous, massive dogs, and apparently were known for striking terror into various foreign ministers who dealt with uh, Bismarck. In digging around on this, I found one other description. This is from a 1921 lecture on international relations by the diplomat James Bryce. I remember an anecdote which illustrates the way in which a man may use opportunities and try to read the character or to obtain an obvious advantage when dealing with a foreign minister. I do not vouch for the truth of the story, but tell it as I heard it in Berlin. One of the admirers of Prince Bismarck had presented to him as a gift a large and powerful dog. It was, I think, a wolfhound or something between a wolfhound and a mastiff, a big animal of formidable appearance. It had a habit of growling and sometimes even of snapping when it found reason to suspect that anyone displeased its master. Bismarck frequently kept this dog, which is known in Berlin as the Reichshund, or the Hound of the Empire, by his side when he received foreign ambassadors. The story went that the dog would now and then growl and show its teeth in a threatening way at the foreign ambassador, who was seated hard by, not far from the creature's fangs. Bismarck seemed to relish the uneasiness which the ambassador could not help showing at the behavior of the dog, and he derived from his visitor's embarrassment an advantage in his negotiations similar to that which is, I believe, sought in the game of baseball by the practice of what you call rattling the pitcher. So that appears to be true and is a good lesson in statecraft from yeah. Bismarck. I was going to say, I'm surprised that more world leaders don't, don't adopt do that. that. Yes, <laughs> It's easy to do, I guess. Here's a good one uh, from reader Joe Antonini. The prisoners behind the largest prison break in history communicated in Esperanto to hide their plans. Nearly 800 prisoners escaped from the San Cristobal prison in northern Spain in 1938, many of them loyalists. But the prison break wasn't very effective as most were recaptured and around 200 were shot after being found. Only three made it to the French border. My notes say this appears to be true, but it's very hard to find sources in English, which is surprising given the size of the exploit. 800 prisoners is a lot of prisoners. The most detailed article I can find on this is itself in Esperanto, which <laughs> ironically prevents me from learning about the prison break. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes if anyone out there knows Esperanto. I'm interested in learning about the, the prison break itself, but also in particular the role of communicating in Esperanto. It seems like a clever way to hide your plans. I'm just curious whether any of our listeners know Esperanto. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Uh, from listener Tyler St. Clair, he writes, Hi, Greg, I'm doing some research for a concert on, of colonial Christmas music, and while I was looking up the history of one of the songs, I found a story I thought you'd like. Kemp's jig was seemingly written to commemorate William Kemp, who, on a bed, of course, Morris danced his way from London to Norwich in nine days, a distance of around 100 miles. This appears to be true. Uh, Kemp was one of the players in Shakespeare's early plays and apparently extremely popular in his time, and under a bet engaged to dance his way 100 miles between these two cities. In fact, uh, there was some doubt about this. It appears that he, he made the journey in either 1599 or 1600 and published a pamphlet in 1600 uh, commemorating this called Kemp's Nine Days Wonder to Quiet Doubters. Here's an excerpt from that. This is about the seventh day's journal, journey being Friday of the third week. Upon Friday morning, I set on towards Thetford, dancing then ten miles in three hours, for I left Barry somewhat after seven in the morning and was at Thetford somewhat after ten that same forenoon. But instead, considering, but indeed considering how I had been loot booted the other day's journey before, and that all this way are the most of it was over a heath, it was no great wonder, for I fared like one that had escaped the stocks and tried the use of his legs to outrun the constable. So light was my heels that I counted the ten mile no better than a leap." At my entrance into Thetford, the people came in great numbers to see me, for there were many there, being size time. The noble gentleman Sir Edwin Rich gave me entertainment in such bountiful sort during my continuance there Saturday and Sunday that I want fit words to express the least part of my worthy usage of my unworthiness. And to conclude liberally, as he had begun and continued at my departure on Monday, his worship gave me five pound. I wonder what he would think to know that people remember this 400 years later. It seems like a small thing, but it's, it's surprising what gets remembered sometimes. Finally, here is an interesting passage from Gregory Kipper's book, Investigator's Guide to Steganography. Margaret Thatcher, the former British prime minister, used a method of invisible watermarking in the 1980s. After several cabinet documents had been leaked to the press, Thatcher ordered that the word processors being used by government employees encode their identity in the word spacing of the document. This allowed for disloyal ministers to be quickly found out. That's very interesting to me, in part because if you're old enough to remember the word processors of the 1980s, they were infuriatingly difficult to use, and it impresses me that it was possible even to, to do this. They would al slightly alter the word spacing in documents so they could be tied to the people who had written them. I think this is true. I found it mentioned in several technical documents, but these tend to cite one another rather than some authoritative government or news source. So if anyone knows any more details about that, I'd love to find out about it. 
I will put links and citations to all of these things in the show notes as usual. If you have uh, any answers to the questions or anything at all to say, please write to us at podcast at futilitycloset.com. This episode is brought to you by our patrons and by Harry's. You know how razor companies keep putting out new models and raising their already high prices? Well, our friends over at Harry's don't believe in upcharging. They've just made a bunch of improvements to their razors, and they're keeping prices exactly the same. They're still just $2 per blade compared to the $4 or more you'll pay at the drugstore. Harry's five-blade razors now include a softer flex hinge for a more comfortable glide, a trimmer blade for hard-to-reach places, a lubricating strip, and a textured handle for more control when it's wet. Harry's was founded by two friends to offer guys a great shave at a fair price. By owning the factory in Germany where they make the blades, Harry's can produce high-quality razors themselves and sell them online for half the price of drugstore brands. Quality is always 100% guaranteed. If you don't love your shave, Harry's will fully refund you. Harry's starter set is an amazing deal. You'll get a weighted razor handle of your choice, moisturizing shave cream, three precision-engineered five-blade cartridges, and a travel cover, all for just 15 bucks. And for a limited time only, there's a special offer for fans of the show where you can get it for less. We've partnered with Harry's to give you $5 off your first purchase with promo code CLOSET. Go to harrys.com right now and enter code CLOSET at checkout to claim your offer. That's harrys.com and enter the code CLOSET. In episode 108, I discuss some extreme races that people subject themselves to in search of extraordinary challenges. Charles Hargrove wrote in to add a couple more to the list, starting with the 40 people who attempt the Barkley Marathon every year. It's a 100-mile run through the mountains of Tennessee inspired by the escape of James Earl Ray from prison. There are many years when no one finishes. And the Barkley Marathon is actually a rather crazy race. The organizers have been selecting 40 people each year to run it since it started in 1986. Uh, It's less of a race than an extreme challenge where the point seems to be simply to attempt to complete it. Uh, So far, only 14 people have managed to do that. And if someone does complete it, they try to make it harder for the next year. 14 people since 1986? <clears throat> yes, and they do 40, 40 people a year, right. In 30 years. Yes, and uh, 14 people have managed to finish it. Uh, Gary Laz Cantrell, one of the race's co-founders, said of the race, After James Earl Ray assassinated Martin Luther King Jr., he was held in the park in Brushy Mountain State Prison, which is where they kept the worst of the worst because it's surrounded by the Tennessee mountains. They call those mountains the third wall. If you get over the first two walls of prison, you're not going to escape the third. When Ray escaped, he was out for 54 hours, and they found him only eight miles from the prison. (laughs) So, yeah, that's pretty daunting. Uh, And so, though, uh, Ray only managed to cover eight miles in those 54 hours. And so the organizers started the race at covering 55 miles in 60 hours. Just, I don't even know where they got that from. And it took four years of races for anyone to be able to finish that. Uh, So after someone finished it, they decided, well, now we need to make it 100 miles, which took another six years until someone was able to finish that one. But someone did. Someone did. Yeah. Well, 14 people have in total, but and now it's 100 miles. Yes. Um, Cantrell has said, the best description of the course I've heard, someone told me that every ultra has its signature hill, the nasty one that's totally unreasonable and makes or breaks the race. The Barkley is like all those hills just put end on end. (laughs) Um, besides the extreme difficulty of the course, one of the challenges of the Barkley is just figuring out how to compete in it. The registration date and requirements aren't posted and can be rather unusual, such as having to bring a pair of socks for the organizers. Beverly Abs, a two-time Barkley competitor, has said, There's an email listserv for the Barkley, and when a new person gets accepted and starts asking questions on the listserv, the veterans will just lie. They'll put up amazing stories about what needs to be done and what happens. For a virgin, half of getting to the start line is working through the lies. Um, the Barkley will start any time between midnight and noon on the race day with one hour before the race being signaled by the blowing of a conch. So apparently you just wait around listening for that. The race officially begins when a cigarette is let, lit by the race director. And in addition to running, the competitors have to find between 9 and 11 books along the course and remove the page corresponding to the, racers, uh, to the runner's race number from each book as uh, proof that they've completed that task. 
Uh, for those who want to learn more about the Barkley, Charles notes that there is a documentary about the race available on Netflix called The Barkley Marathons, The Race That Eats Its Young. <laughs> Um, And just in case that didn't sound daunting enough, Charles also let us know about an ascetic practice performed by some Tendai Buddhist monks that is rather a supreme test of determination and endurance. It's called the Kai Ho Gyo, or Circling the Mountain. And this is a 1,000-day challenge that involves walking a route on Mount Hiye, and it takes seven years to complete the full course of it. In the most extreme version of the challenge, during each of the first three years, the monks walk or run 40 kilometers or almost 25 miles a day for 100 days. Uh, So that's basically a marathon a day for 100 straight days. And that goes up to 200 days in a row for years four and five. Then in year six, it's 60 kilometers or about 37 miles a day for 100 days, with year seven being 84 kilometers or 52 miles a day for 100 days followed by another 100 days of 40 kilometers each. And then in addition, during the fifth year, the monk is required to spend several days without food, water, or sleep, sitting in the lotus position in the temple, continuously reciting a mantra for one of the gods, with a monk on either side of him to be sure that he doesn't fall asleep, stop, or pass out. Uh, Wikipedia reports that this period lasts for seven and a half days, but both The Guardian and The New York Times report that the period is actually nine days and that the point of it is to push yourself almost to the edge of death. It sounds like it would. Yeah, I wasn't aware that you could go for nine days without sleep um, or water. I mean, I think water is even more believable than sleep. I thought people started to hallucinate and stuff when they don't get sleep for many days. But I don't know. I guess you have a monk on either side of you to keep you from (laughs) getting too weird. Um, when a monk starts the whole challenge, after the first 100 days, he has to petition the senior monks to be able to continue. And if he does that, that then commits him to completing the whole course. So after day 101, a monk must either finish the course or take his own life. And it's said that the, mountains con- the mountain contains many unmarked graves of the monks that were unable to complete the challenge. Now, supposedly, nowadays, the requirement is a little more symbolic than literal, and the selection process is designed to ensure that those who do commit to the course will likely finish it. But the New York Times interviewed Gensing Fu Shinami, a monk who completed the Kai Ho Gyo in 2003, and he said that during the challenge, he carried a length of rope and a short sword so that if for some reason he could not finish one of his daily treks, he could use one of those to kill himself. (laughs) Fushinami told the Times, I would have chosen the rope over the knife because it's faster and cleaner, but fortunately, it rarely comes to that. Um, Only 46 men have completed the 1,000-day challenge since 1885, and of these, three have completed the circuit twice, most recently Yusai Sakai, who first did the circuit from 1973 to 1980, and then after a half-year pause, did it again, finishing his second round in 1987 at age 60. So he spent seven years doing that and then turned around and do it again. (laughs) Yeah, six months later, he's turned around and started again. So don't I feel like a slacker? (laughs) (laughs) The lateral thinking puzzle in episode 114 was about a listener trying to figure out why his stepfather's computer seemed to be turning on the radio. Tony Hart wrote, When I first heard the description of the lateral thinking puzzle, it immediately brought to mind a demonstration I had seen using an IBM 1130 mini computer in high school in 1969. Like most computers of the time, the 1130 put out electromagnetic noise, which could be picked up on an AM radio. Some bright coder somewhere figured out how to write a program on punch cards in those days that modulated the noise to play a tune on a transistor radio. Great music it wasn't, but for someone like me who had access to a computer for the first time, it was a neat trick. It is a neat trick. And that is just so cool to think, like, just in the lifetime of some of our listeners, how much things have changed. Like, wow, it's amazing. And Jesse McGee wrote, The story of Pop's radio that was mysteriously turning on when his computer was locking up reminded me of the following story I was told by a good friend. My friend was in the TV uh, electronics repair business for years. They had a single and, by his reports, quite attractive young lady purchase a new console model television from the shop where he was employed. A month or two later, she calls to say she's having a problem. 
Every day between 10 and 11 a.m., the TV would either turn itself on or off, depending on the state it was in on the time, at the time. The TV had no timer of any sort, wasn't connected to a timer, and there was nothing odd about the power coming into the house. They brought the unit into the shop and couldn't replicate the problem. After the set was returned, she reported the same problem again, and this went on for months. They replaced the remote, the remote sensor, numerous parts. Nothing worked. Then they didn't hear from her for a month or two. She came into the shop for another reason and reported the problem had stopped. And there was much rejoicing as nothing frustrates repair people more than a nitpicky problem they can't find. A few months later, the problem began to occur again. Between 10 and 11 a.m., the TV would power on or off. Perplexed and single as it happened, one of the techs decided to go out and sit in her house to see what was happening, and he found the problem. At that time of the year, the sun was lined up in such a way that it reflected off the building across the street into her window and struck the front of the television, thus causing one of the few parts they'd failed to replace, the power switch, to heat up and either lose or make contact. He suggested she close her curtains when she went to work, which solved the problem. Thanks for a great podcast and blog. Um, and Jesse's friend's story would make a pretty good lateral thinking puzzle in itself if anyone wants to try to use it to That's stump their idea. friends. Yeah. Although if you had given it to me as a puzzle, I think I would have had a hard time believing that that would really happen. <laughs> and I guess that just shows life truly is stranger than fiction sometimes. Um, thanks so much to everyone who writes in to us. And if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to us at podcast at futilitycloset.com. And please add some hints on how to pronounce your name. It's my turn to try to solve a lateral thinking puzzle. Greg is going to give me an odd sounding situation and I have to try to figure out what's actually going on asking only yes or no questions. Ready? I hope so. A jockey loses his first steeplechase race, but wins the second by a head. After the race, rather than celebrating, he doesn't speak to the horse's owner and, in fact, never races again. Why? Okay. When you say he loses by a head, I mean, does somebody or something actually lose a head? <laughs> no. I'm happy to say no. <laughs> just, just checking. <laughs> Some gruesome you, accident. You, you never know with these things. <laughs> well, that would explain it. We should do uh, that one sometime. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> do I need to know more about the details of a steeplechase race? Is there some important no, detail actually about you don't. a steeplechase race? Okay. It's just a horse race. Um, does the exact time period matter? No. Does the location matter? No. Okay. Is the jockey's identity important? No. Is there some specific characteristic about the jockey that's important, like uh, gender or uh, abilities or... Uh, I'll, like some defining characteristic. About I'll say no. I don't think there is. No. Okay. So a jockey loses the first steeplechase race, mm -hmm. but then wins a second one. Yes. Is the second one somehow connected to the first one in some way? No. No. It's just a different race. Yes. On the same horse? Uh, Does it matter? It doesn't matter, actually. I don't know the answer to that. But he was racing for the same owner? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. So there, there is a jockey who has some relationship to the owner of horses. Yes. And he's racing for this horse owner. Yes. And he wins the second race, but ne doesn't speak to the horse's owner. Right. And never races again. Correct. Is the jockey a he? Should I say he yes. for him? Okay. Does the jockey feel, um, would you say that the jockey feels ashamed of something that happened? No, I wouldn't say that. Guilty? No. Is the jockey dead? Yes. <laughs> the jockey did lose his head. <laughs> Where okay. did that come from? You went from ashamed to guilty to dead. <laughs> because you were sort of trying not to smile. I'm like <laughs> looking for every clue I can get here. Um, and I'm like, okay, it's not that the jockey's ashamed or guilty. So the jockey's dead. The jockey died during the steeplechase yes, race? Yes, you've basically got it. This oh actually happened. Gosh. On June 4th, 1923, 35-year-old jockey Frank Hayes won a steeplechase at Belmont Park in New York State. Riding a horse called Sweet Kiss, he won by a head, beating odds of 20 to 1. Apparently, he died in the middle of the race, but he was still in the saddle at the finish, making him the first and so far the only jockey to have won a race after death. <laughs> he was oh discovered to be dead only when the horse's owner came to congratulate him after the race. It's thought that he had a heart attack, possibly due to the strain of slimming down from 142 to 130 pounds shortly before the race. At the uh, discovery of his death, the Jockey Club dropped all the customary regulations and declared him the winner without the customary weighing in. He was buried three days later in his racing silks. 
So, so there isn't actually a rule that you have to be alive at the end of the race in order to win. <laughs> there wasn't in 1923, apparently. Very good. Um, if anybody has a puzzle that they'd like to send in for us to use, whether somebody dies or loses a head or not, uh, you can send it to us at podcast at futilitycloset.com. If you've been enjoying our podcast and learning even more ways that people can die in lateral thinking puzzles, then please consider becoming a patron to help support the show. The podcast is a big commitment of time to research and produce each week, and if it weren't for the support that we get from our fantastic patrons, we would have had to have given up on making this show quite some time ago. If you want to help out, please check out our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash futilitycloset, or see the link in the show notes. If you're looking for more quirky curiosities, check out the Futility Closet books on Amazon or visit the website at futilitycloset.com where you can sample more than 9,000 singular Quillicoms. At the website, you can also see the show notes for the podcast and listen to previous episodes. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can reach us by email at podcast at futilitycloset.com. Our music was written and produced by the talented Doug Ross. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.